together for Elder C. Thomas Carson. Amen. Thank you. Please, please be seated. Um, it's always a, a privilege to stand before you and minister God's word. We're going to be ministering Love Came Down at Christmas. The uh, scriptures we're going to be looking at are many, but I'm going to start with uh, John 3, verses 14 through 21. Now, when we minister... Uh, we don't know if you got it unless you say, got it. got it. Amen. So if you get it, then let us know by saying, got it. How many of you know that Elder brings props when he teaches? All right. So you've been given uh, an envelope with instructions not to open it, and I hope all of you have been obedient. Now, there's uh, some lyrics to a song, which you can look at. We're going to use those later. So these are the props that I have. Hmm, looks like a magnet, some screws, an empty tube of toothpaste, some tissues, don't ask. And, of course, what's in this envelope, which is absolutely from God to you. Each one is individually for you. But don't look in there until I tell you, all right? Amen. So let's start. We're going to be uh, using the NLT version. Father God, thank you for this day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world, for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, media, Numbers 21, 4 through 9, please. Jesus made a remarkable statement explaining that the serpent of Numbers 21, 4 through 9 was a picture of the Messiah and his work. Verse 
Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Serpents are often used as pictures of evil in the Bible. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 5, please, media. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit of the trees of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God knowing both good and evil. Revelations 12, 9, please. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So as I said, serpents are often used as pictures of evil in the Bible, as illustrated in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, and Revelation 12, 9. However, Moses' serpent in Numbers 21 was made of bronze. Please bring up uh, the picture of the uh, serpent. Bronze is a metal associated with judgment in the Bible because bronze is with fire, a picture of judgment. So a bronze serpent does not speak of sin, but of sin judged. In the same way, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us on the cross, and our sin was judged in him, a bronze serpent is a picture of sin judged and sin dealt with. Now, our medical people, what does that remind you of? The what? The caduceus. So if you see an ambulance, it will have like a star and the caduceus. If the serpent was laying horizontally on the vertical pole, it would be easy to see how this would be a visual representation of the cross. However, many traditions show the serpent being wrapped around the pole. This is the source for the ancient figure of healing and medicine, a serpent wrapped around a pole. Smack dab in the middle of the Exodus epic, we find a strange little story as the Israelites moved from Egypt towards the promised land. They developed a chronic grumbling problem. Have any of us ever experienced that? Oh, <laughs> oh me, oh my. God's people continued to bellyache. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone is bitten, looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made the bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. God delivered first judgment, but then he delivered mercy. Now this wasn't backpedaling or flip-flopping. It was his divine nature on full display. Because he is holy, he must deal with our sin. Because he is love, he chooses to offer us mercy. When the grumbling Israelites looked at the bronze serpent held high on a pole, they were saved from the punishment they deserved. Mercifully, God used the emblem of his judgment to draw his people back to himself. That's good news for them, and that points to even better news for us. In Numbers 21, 4 through 9, the people were saved not by doing anything, but by simply looking to the bronze serpent. They had to trust that something as seemingly foolish as looking at such a thing would be sufficient to save them. And surely some perished because they thought it too foolish to do such a thing. Have we ever been there? Isaiah 45, 22, please, media. As it says in Isaiah 45, 22, let all the world look to me for salvation, for I am God. There is no other. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. We might be willing to do a hundred things to earn our salvation, but God commands us to only trust in him, to look to him. Simple. Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. Even though Jesus bore our sins, he never became a sinner. Even his becoming sin for us was a holy, righteous act of love. Jesus remained the Holy One throughout the entire ordeal of the cross. He must be lifted up. He must die because he would save. And he would save because he loved. Lifted up. This is a term later used to describe uh, both Jesus' crucifixion and his ascension. John 12, 32, media please. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Acts 2. And verse 33. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven, at God's right hand, and the Father as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. So, if the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. I've asked our young brother O'Shea to assist us here, and he has graciously agreed. O'Shea, come on down. We're going to do a little demonstration. 
So leave that there. All right. Let's give O'Shea a round. Thank you, my brother. OK, I want you to stand over here a little bit further to the side. OK, so this represents a man or a woman. Jesus is the magnet of men. This represents Jesus. And it said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So what I want you to do is to use Jesus to take all of these out of here. And you'll go like this, OK? You can't. And, and I, then as you do that, instead of putting them back into here like I just did, I want you to take them off and put them into this cup. That represents heaven. OK, O'Shea, go for it. Now, did you notice? Go ahead, O'Shea, and then put them, put them into heaven. I'll help you. Did you notice something? That as Jesus is drawing the men to him, only some of them are, go ahead, keep continue, are very close. But the others are being drawn. Did you see that? So that's you and me witnessing about the magnet of men, Jesus and drawing others along. OK? Continue. All right. OK. What? What's going on, O'Shea? Some people just refuse to be drawn. Thank you, O'Shea. Thank you very much. Did you get it? God's gift of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Heaven, hell. End of story. John 3.16 has long been celebrated as a powerful, succinct declaration of the gospel. Of the 31,102 verses in the Bible, it may be the most popular single verse used in evangelism. We learn the object of God's love. For God so loved the world. That means you and me. Does it mean he loved me because I'm a minister of the gospel now? Did he love me when I was using drugs? When I was homeless? When I lived under a bridge? When I did things that are unmentionable? Because he loved the world. So no matter where you are in your walk with Christ or not a walk with Christ, he loves you, and he is sending a message through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to draw you out of hell into heaven. Media. If you could uh, get the song ready, Love Came Down at Christmas.
I'm going to say some things here which are going to rock your world. So keep your shoes on, don't throw them at me. When I uh, gave media the message, one of the media departments said, love came down at Christmas? Does Elder know it's January 29th? Yeah, I, I know it's January 29th. So you can look at the lyrics to this poem by Christina Rossetti. This poem describes love. Jesus Christ coming down from heaven on Christmas. This love is on earth for all humankind to feel and learn from. It's a three stanza poem that's separated into sets of four lines known as quatrains. These quatrains follow a specific rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D changing end sounds as the poet fits. This helps with the musical quality of the text and is part of the reason that the poem has persisted in song since 1885. Now, Rossetti makes use of several poetic techniques in this poem. These include, but are not limited to, anaphora, epistrophe, and alliteration. The first, anaphora, is the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of multiple lines, usually in succession. This technique is often used to create emphasis. A list of phrases, items, or actions may be created through its implementation. For example, love, which begins eight of the 12 lines. Anaphora's opposite, epistrophe, is the repetition of the same word or phrase at the end of multiple lines or sentences. So alliteration occurs when words are used in succession, or at least appear close together, as in love, lovely, and love, in the second line of the first stanza. stanza. So if we are to look at a detailed analysis of this poem, Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine, star and angels gave the sign. In the first stanza, the speaker begins by making use of the line that later came to be used as the title of the poem. This line makes a simple statement about the Christmas season, that love appeared there. It came down from heaven in the form of Jesus Christ. He was born to the Virgin Mary, a moment that was marked by the star and angels. The star refers to the star of Bethlehem in the sky. It was seen by the wise men who came to pay homage to the Christ child. The love that came down to earth that day was love divine. Worship we the Godhead. Love incarnate, love divine. Worship we our Jesus, but wherewith for sacred sign. In this second stanza, she speaks of the Godhead. In the Christian tradition, Godhead refers to the divinity of our Christian God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These lines celebrate God, the Christian religion, and the love and peace that came to earth that day, the love is incarnate, meaning that it is embodied in flesh. It was made into human form. Stanza three. Love shall be our token. Love shall be yours and love be mine. Love to God and to all men. Love for plea and gift and sign. In this final stanza, Rossetti adds that love is going to be the savior of all the human race. Think about that for a second. Love is going to be the savior of all human race. It is everything to everyone all the time. It will be our token and belong to every person on the planet. 
When she speaks to you, she isn't talking to a specific person, but to the entire human race. The love will allow them to love not just God, but one another as well. It entered into the world for all men. It is both a gift and a sign. All of us who consider ourselves a part of this Christian tradition have this love at the root of our faith. Please, if you would play that song. Now that you have an understanding of the words, listen. save the world. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. But people loved the darkness more than the light. The enemy has been trying for thousands of years to take you to hell. And Jesus has been drawing you away from the darkness into the light. Love came down at Christmas. Why does Christmas end in December? On the 26th 
People had taken down the lights. All of those good feelings that they've had during that season seem to fade away. How easily we pack them up in a box until the next Christmas season. And we go about our merry way. The enemy has taken the Christmas season, this gift of love, and perverted it so much that we have Christmas in July. You must go shopping. When I was a kid growing up, if you could find a gas station open on Christmas Day, that was big. Now, a whole generation of people have to go to work. FedEx drivers, UPS drivers, the United States Postal Service workers, we're stressed beyond belief. People come into the post office, this has got to go, I'm so stressed, complaining. They don't understand that love came down at Christmas, that we're to celebrate and worship our Jesus every day. Every day. When you stop doing that, bad things can happen. In 2008, I was going through a tough time. And I contemplated suicide every day. Driving across the old Tappan Zee Bridge, I thought about how I could jump off that bridge. I never told my wife, I didn't tell my pastor, that's the enemy. Don't suffer in silence. When I parked the car, the Lord flashed in front of me what would be the outcome of that. What would my wife tell our children? What would my wife tell our grandchildren? And I drove off that bridge. And I've been driving over that bridge every day ever since. But I've gotten a closer relationship with God, with Jesus. Men, you got to stop being afraid to cry. You got to stop being afraid to reach out. If you're having challenges, seek help. Somebody in this sanctuary has considered suicide. Don't do it. Someone out there virtually has thought about it or is thinking about it. This message is for you. Don't do it. God loves you. And he has an awesome plan for your life. You can be a part of the magnet that's going to draw people from the pit of hell. Please bring up that picture. This is a message from God to each and every one of you. And it's personalized. Open that envelope now. You can bring that picture up when you're ready, media. It's the same message for everybody, isn't it? But it's personalized. Today is your day. Jesus hugged you 2,000 years ago. You are made whole. But if today is your day to receive that, then receive that. Today someone's going to hug you so hard that all of your broken pieces are going to fit back together again. You're going to be who God made you to be. You're going to be a person who is going to draw people to Jesus Christ. You are going to be love every day of the year, not just...
just at Christmas. you received that today. No more suffering in silence. Talk to somebody. If you need forgiveness for something, go to that person and ask forgiveness. Matthew 18 them. Don't hold on to baggage from year to year. Don't box it up like you do your Christmas decorations and ornaments. We must be an example to draw people to the light. The enemy comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Imagine if I had stepped off that bridge. What a legacy I would have left the brokenness that would have to be put together, the sense that they would have to make out of this selfish act. Do you know that I got to meet my eldest daughter a couple of years after that, and a granddaughter, and we're a family now? Do you understand what the enemy is trying to do? Steal, kill. Destroy. We can stop it now. Don't ever let the love that came down at Christmas dim and fade in your life. Because someone is looking to you. There's needy people all over the world and things are going to get a whole lot worse than they are now. One of my classmates, <clears throat> Jim Z, a.k.a. Tank, sent me this, and it's scriptural. Pastor, you'll appreciate this. This is the Amplified. <clears throat> Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way, and that your body may keep well, even as I know your soul keeps well and prospers. All around us, we see worried people. Many are plagued by financial difficulties and family or marriage problems. Other, others suffer from diseases and pain. It can be easy to conclude that these problems are normal and that we cannot escape their grip. When they go through these problems, some Christians even doubt God, and they start thinking like people who do not know Him. But the Bible confirms this promise. God truly wants us to be in health, to prosper in every way. That is, is His implicit desire for each and every one of us. The desire is expressed throughout the Bible. Think about this promise from Jesus. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. God wants us to experience the abundant life. He wants us to be victorious and not defeated. He does not want us to be sick or in pain but to be healthy, and he has promised to meet us at our needs according to his riches in glory. Think about God's desire for you. Don't be discouraged, even if your needs may seem overwhelming. Don't allow the thief to steal your victory. Confess the promises in God's word and commit your problems to him. Believe Him for health and prosperity. Ask Him to grant you His fullest blessings and to heal every disease, 
remove every worry, and give you abundant life. I hope that you've received something from this message today. To God be the glory. So, there's one prop that I didn't use. Tube of toothpaste. When I was contemplating suicide, I was empty. I was squeezed. But there was nothing to come out. I was drained. I was depleted. The word had left me. So, what's my message? Continue to fellowship together. To come and uplift one another. Feast on the word. If you're feeling a little empty, when, when, when your gas tank hits the half mark, Dee Dee goes and fills it up. Me, I'm more of when it gets down around the E, and I had to learn the hard way, E does not mean enough. <laughs> it means empty. So, re-energize yourselves. Refill yourselves. Don't let the enemy catch you. empty, because bad things can happen. Amen? Thank you, thank you. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. So, we never a service without an altar call. It's an opportunity to allow Jesus to draw you to him. And out of the clutches of the enemy who has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's a simple confession that you'll make with your mouth and believe in your heart. And you'll be saved. And then you're going to take a journey. And it's a spiritual journey. Unite with like-minded people of like faith. Join a church. A church that teaches the word of the Bible. Don't join a church for a personality. So bow your heads and just repeat this. Father God, I believe that you are God and that you sent your son to the earth to suffer, bleed, and die to be resurrected the third day. Victorious. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. I believe these things. I accept salvation right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. It's as simple as that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God loves you. God loves you, girl. You're going to be okay.
Hallelujah. Media yo put this in so tight I can't even get it out. I'm not even going to try. Kevin said just pull it. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is doing something right there. We're going to leave that. But I believe Jesus is still drawing. standing up here crying because we know what just happened you see God just took somebody who was headed to hell and now they're going to hell and oh look at this I see two little things that are not in heaven or hell. They're just kind of sitting there. That somebody under the sound of my voice. You haven't made that decision yet. And you're like, is this real? Heaven and hell are as real as your right hand and your left. You have to choose which one. ago, Hopi. I used to think salvation was something for old people. But young people, man, we just had our whole life ahead of us. And, you know, we could just, you know, carry on. And then when we got old, we could, you know, serve God because we'd already lived our life. And then one day, one of my high school students died in my arms, the victim of a gunshot. Nobody promised you you're going to get old. I know we stand in faith that with long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. But that's a promise to the godly, not the world. Love came down on Christmas. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, Some people are like this one right here, just dangling. You're saved, but your life is still a wreck. And you know it. And sometimes you even wonder if you are saved. You wonder if you're really born again. Because the devil yaps in your ear, you ain't saved. If you were saved, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't go there. You wouldn't look at that. You wouldn't listen to that. When Jesus saves you, saves you. He didn't save you because you were good. He saved you because you were bad. And he will help you to become good. So see that little guy hanging on for dear life? You notice he's hanging on to another screw. Somebody else in the body of Christ just will not let him go. And he thinks he's so weak. And he's just hanging on by a fingernail. And yet, he's still able to affect somebody else. Maybe he can't pull him to Christ, but maybe he can just nudge him in the right direction. So that all people can be drawn unto Jesus Christ. Elder C. Thomas Carson, that's my powerful messages I've ever heard in my life. I bawled and I'm still bawling like a baby because love, the love of God, compels me. Surely the presence of God has been manifested in this place today. If you have not acknowledged Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, there's still time to Jesus. We've already said the prayer. You may not have done like my new baby sister and come up to Tommy. But right where you are, if you want to acknowledge, you know something, I received salvation. I ain't playing this no more. I'm not taking any more chances with my eternal destiny. 
right where you're sitting now. Raise your hand. I want God to 